We appreciate everyone's presence today. I know we do have some uh, visiting with us this morning. We're glad you're here. Uh, some are traveling and uh, on, on their way to another destination, and our prayers will be with you that you'll have safe travels. Uh, we do hope that you have opportunities to visit with us again sometime, and I um, and, uh, hope that you will take advantage of that opportunity. Uh, if you will this morning, let's turn to the book of Romans. We've been reading through the book of Romans in our Sunday morning and Sunday evening worship. We read the last chapter uh, this, this morning. Uh, I had thought when we began that, that <clears throat> periodically I might select a passage and, uh, from the reading and, and preach on it. Uh, that didn't work out quite the way I thought it might. But I do want to take a look at a, a passage from the book of Romans this morning from chapter 6 primarily. In the very beginning of the book of Romans, Paul sets out what we might call his, you know, his thematic statement. I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, but the righteous shall live by faith. Uh, the rest of the book of Romans can sort of be seen as an elaboration on that, on that one statement. That the gospel is God's power to salvation. And, and he explains how that, how that works in the remaining part of the book of Romans. Uh, the way I outline the book of Romans, and you probably won't find this in any, any book, I don't suppose, but the way I organize it in my mind is something like this. Paul says that the gospel is God's power to salvation. In the following passages, chapter 1 and verse 18, going through chapter 3, and uh, verse 20, Paul establishes a universal need for the gospel. Everyone needs the gospel. Everyone needs the gospel because everyone is lost and they need to be saved. And so within that particular passage, you find statements like, All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And so the gospel is God's power to salvation. Everyone needs the gospel because everyone is lost. A second thing that he does is he describes the, or explains the, well now I've kind of struggled to come up with a good summary of this passage, but the essential event of the gospel. What, what is the, the event that is at the essence, or that the, contains the essence of the gospel? Well, it's the crucifixion of Jesus. And in chapter 3, beginning in verse 21 and going through the end of that, we find that event explained. That in the death of Jesus, in the shedding of the blood of Jesus, God's wrath is turned away from us. So Jesus propitiates God's wrath by His death on the cross. And so that's sort of the essential element or event of the gospel explained. In chapter 4, we have the scriptural proof or scriptural support of the gospel. And so the gospel is God's salvation, power to salvation to everyone who believes. And in chapter 4, Paul refers to and, and uh, explains and elaborates on Genesis chapter 15 and verse 6, where we find that Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him for righteousness. And so how is it that Abraham was justified by, before God? It was by faith. And so Abraham believed God. You see, Genesis 15 and verse 6 emphasizes the faith of Abraham. And so Abraham is justified by faith. And of course, he acted upon that faith in following the commands of God's, but he was justified by faith. And so Paul does what, what we try to do, support his teaching by, by referring to Scripture. Well, then in the beginning in chapter 5, we have some of the benefits of the gospel uh, explained to us and laid out for us, that we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, and the effects of Adam... Uh, the sin that he introduced in the world, the consequences of that sin are reversed and nullified through the gospel of Christ. And so we benefit in those ways through the gospel. In chapter 6 and going through chapter 8, we find obligations and assurances of the gospel. And so we obey the gospel that that brings to us when we obey certain obligations. And we'll say more about that in just a few minutes. And then from chapters 9 through chapter 11, Israel and the nations under the gospel. And so that's kind of an outline of the book of Romans. And as I hinted at just a moment ago, I want to concentrate on a statement found in chapter 6. 
Paul has argued that the grace of God is sufficient to cover sin. The grace of God is sufficient to cover all sin. The grace of God is sufficient to cover not only every sin, but every sin as often as it has been committed through time. And so the, where, where sin abounds, Paul says, grace abounds all the more in chapter 5 and verse 20. Periodically in the book of Romans, Paul will raise a question as, as, as if it had been asked or might be asked by someone responding to his teaching. And so Paul has said, where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. And so a person might commit sin, and yet he still has hope of being saved, because God's grace is sufficient to cover that sin. Well, Paul anticipates in chapter 6 and verse 1, someone might say, we can continue in sin so that grace might abound. And so, if there's always sufficient grace to cover sin, no matter how many times we sin, well, why don't we just continue to sin so that there'll be more grace in the world? Grace in the world is a good thing, and so let's continue in sin so that grace may abound. And so, the question simply is, and I suppose essentially is, if we are saved by God's grace, does that permit us to sin? Is that a sort of license to sin? Because we're saved by God's grace. Well, he responds to that question in chapter 6. And he uses three analogies. Uh, in chapter 6, in the first part of chapter 7, he uses three analogies to deal with this particular question. Shall we continue in sin? He says, in, a, in, in essence, no. And In fact, that is his answer in verse 2. May it never be, or God forbid, or we might say absolutely not. Well, why not? Well, the first point he's, he makes is that, well, you know, when a person obeys the gospel, when a person obeys the gospel and his sins are forgiven by God's grace, he dies to sin. He's like an individual that has died. He's died, in this case, he's died to sin. And so let's just read a few passages, and as we read through these passages, notice these expressions. That we have died to sin, that our old man was crucified with him, so the body of sin might be done away. We died with Christ. He who has died is freed from sin. Consider yourselves dead to sin, and we are buried with Christ into death. And so... Shall we continue in sin? No, we died to sin. That's the answer to the question. No, absolutely not. Because when we resorted to the gospel, we died to sin. And so let's just read. Shall we continue in sin that grace may increase? Verse 2. May it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into His death? Therefore, we've been buried with Him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For we become united with Him in the likeness of His death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of His resurrection. Knowing this, that our old self was crucified with Him in order that our body of sin might be done away with, so that we are no longer slaves to sin. For he who has died is freed from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with Him. Knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again, death no longer is master over Him. For the death that He died, He died to sin once for all, but the life that He lives, He lives to God. Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. And so we have died to sin. How, how can we continue in sin? We've died to sin. Oh, to, to take that idea a little bit further, on the other hand, we are alive to God. And so we walk in a new kind of life. We've died to sin. That's not the end of the story. We've become alive. We've been made alive. We are alive now with God. And so notice in verse 4, so we too might walk in newness of life, a new kind of life. And then in verse 11, Consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. 
So in the discussion, Paul draws upon the union between Christ and believers, Christ and His disciples. Christ died to sin, verse 10. Christ died to sin. So those who are united with Christ have also died to sin. They've been buried with Him and united with Him. And as Christ was made alive, so we also have been made alive to live lives that are pleasing to God. When do these things take place? When is it that we die to sin, we are buried with Christ, we are raised up to begin a new kind of life, a life to God, a life lived in an effort to please Him? Well, it takes place in baptism, doesn't it? That's what he says in verse 3. Don't you know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ have been baptized into His death? We were buried with Him in the action of baptism, having repented of our sins. You know, we, we become dead to sin. We've repented of our sins. We are buried with Him as we are immersed in the water. We are buried with Him in the likeness of His death. And then we are raised up to begin a new life. And so these things, this change, this change that takes place in us uh, begins at repentance and baptism. The question then is, have we died to sin? Have we died to sin? Are we alive to God? Are we living in God? Or living toward God in a, in a Godward fashion where all of our thoughts, all of our motivations, all of our actions are done with God in the forefront of our mind and pleasing God as our objective. And so have we died to sin? If we've died to sin, you can't continue to live in sin. If we're continuing in sin, we really haven't truly died to sin. It's as simple as that, isn't it? If we've died to sin, we'll then die to sin. Well, here's the second analogy. When a person obeys the gospel... He is freed from enslavement to sin, impurity, and lawlessness. Now, this particular analogy will begin in verse 15, and then, and then we'll read several verses on down, but uh, make a few comments before we do that. Now, slavery was common in the Roman world. Uh, there were oh, a large percentage of Roman uh, people that lived in the, under the Roman government were, were slaves. Uh, my understanding is slavery in the Roman world differed to some degree from slavery that was practiced in the United States in, in, in the past. But still, a slave is a slave. He's the property of his master. Someone has described a slave as a human tool. And so, a man who's a farmer might have, he might have a plow, he might have a shovel, he might have a hoe, he might have a rake, he might have a slave, you know. That's, that's what a slave is. He's a human tool. The master has authority over the slave, and the slave has an obligation to obey, to obey his masters or his master. Sometimes a slave might come under the authority of a new master. He might, for one reason or another, leave this master and become a slave of a different man or a different master. Of course, when that takes place, he's obligated, still obligated, still obligated to obey the commands of his new master. And so, in this passage, Paul uses this kind of transition as an illustration of our situation in Christ. At one time, we were enslaved to sin. We were enslaved to impurity and lawlessness. But we've come under the authority of a new master. Now, we're still under obligation. We're still a slave. But we're on, ob, under obligation to a new master, which, of course, is, in this case, a much better situation than the one we were in before. Notice that they had been slaves of sin. Verse 16, do you not know that when you present yourself to someone as slaves for obedience, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin resulting in death or of obedience resulting in righteousness? But thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed. And having been freed from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. And so you were slaves of sin, he says there in verses 16 and 17. He says it again in verse 20. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. And so we are slaves at one time, slaves to sin... 
which involves us in being a slave to impurity and lawlessness. Look at verse 19. I'm speaking in human terms. And so I think he's just saying, uh, I'm using a human illustration so that you can understand it. I'm speaking in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, resulting in further unlawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, resulting in sanctification. And so you are slaves to sin. You are slaves to impurity. You are slaves to lawlessness. And verse 19 says, in being a slave to lawlessness, that only promoted more lawlessness. <laughs> well, well, how can that be? Well, maybe an illustration will, will, su will su suffice. Uh, you ever told a lie? And then in order to, tell, in order to cover up that lie, you've you got, you got to tell another lie. <laughs> And then maybe to cover up that one, you've got to tell another one, and then maybe another one, and another. And pretty soon you kind of lose track of all the lies you told. And Well, you see, lying only leads to lying, which leads to more lying. And so being enslaved to lawlessness, enslaved to sin, enslaved to impurity, that, that only gets us in more and more trouble as, as time passes. But the, the destiny of slaves of sin is, is death. And so verse 16, that we may be slaves of sin resulting in death. And then he says it again in verse 21, Therefore what benefit were you then deriving from the things of which you are now ashamed? And so when you were slaves of sin, what good did that do you? Now you're, you're ashamed of those things now, but you think about your past. Think about what you were doing. And what benefit did you derive from that kind of behavior? The outcome of those things is death. And of course, he means spiritual death. And then he says it again in verse 23, the wages of sin is death. A slave, especially maybe in the Roman Empire, a slave could accumulate money. He might be paid for his work. But here this passage says, the wages of sin, if you're, if you're enslaved to sin, what do you expect to be paid? Well, the wages of sin is death. On the other hand, they had become enslaved to God. Look at verse 22. But now having been freed from sin and enslaved to God, you derive your benefit resulting in sanctification and the outcome eternal life. And so they've changed masters or we change masters. When we become a Christian, when we obey the gospel, we get out from under that enslavement to sin and we become slaves of God. We become enslaved to God. Enslaved to righteousness. That is, our work is to do righteous things, things that are right. And the initial result of that is sanctification or holiness. And so a person who is enslaved to God, he's serving God, he's working righteousness. That produces in him a holy life. And the ultimate outcome of that is eternal life. And so verse 22 again, Now having been freed from sin and enslaved to God, you derive your benefit, resulting in sanctification and the outcome, eternal life. The transition is a drastic one, isn't it? Enslaved to sin, impurity, lawlessness, the result is death. We've transitioned to a new master. Enslaved to God, working righteousness, which produces in us holiness and the ultimate outcome, eternal life. Imagine a slave in times gone by who transitioned from a brutal master whose only future held premature death. And so here's a slave and his master is absolutely brutal. If he doesn't do exactly what the master wants, he ties him up and beats him. He gives him little food and poor quality food at that. His housing is awful. He doesn't have enough clothes to wear. And so he's doomed. He's doomed to a premature death. And he has an opportunity then to begin to serve another master who's good to him, who blesses him, who uh, has plans for, even though he's a slave, has plans for his future. So that he might, in some ways, at least prosper and thrive. The change is a drastic one. Now, we're still a slave. 
Either way, we're still a slave. We're either going to serve sin and look forward to death, or we will serve God and have eternal life as our future. Someone may say, well, I'm not going to be a slave to anyone. No, that's not an option. Not, not, according, not, not as far as this passage is concerned. We are either going to serve sin and death, or we're going to be enslaved to God and look forward to eternal life. Remember that being a servant of God, being enslaved to God is not onerous. It results in sanctification and eternal life. When does this transition take place? When do we get out from under enslavement to sin and become servants or slaves of God? Well, verse 17. Thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed. Having been freed from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. When does this transition begin? It begins when we obey from the heart that form of teaching to which we were committed. When we obey the gospel, when we hear it, when we respond to it in faith, we repent of our sins, we're baptized, our sins are washed away, we, we then become servants of God. And so when does it begin? When we obey the gospel. The third analogy Paul uses to make this point is found in, in chapter 7. And in this passage, in this, in this analogy, he's saying that our relationship changes. And he uses a marriage relationship uh, in this particular passage. He says in verse 1, Or do you not know, brethren, for I'm speaking to those who know the law? And so he may have, especially those with a Jewish background in mind here, though it might have a broader application than that. Or do you not know, brethren, I'm speaking to those who know the law, that the law has jurisdiction over a person as long as he lives. Now here's the analogy. The married woman is bound by law to her husband while he is living. But if her husband dies, she's released from the law concerning her husband. If a woman is married to a man, she's bound to that man. The law of God, the law binds her to that man as long as they live. He goes on to say that if while she is married to that man, she becomes involved with another man, well, she's committed adultery. Verse 3, so then, if while her husband is living, she's joined to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. A, a sin. Uh, the law of Moses says, Exodus 20, verse 14, thou shalt not commit adultery. <laughs> and so she's committed sin. But if her husband dies, so she's married to this man, her first husband, and he dies, well, now she's free from the law. And she can go and be joined to another man with God's blessing. And God will bind her and join her to that man. The, the law that binds husbands and wives together will, will bind them together. And they, they live together with God's approval. But if her husband dies, she's free from the law so that she's not an adulteress, though she is joined to another man. So a woman who's married to a man is joined to him. She has certain responsibilities toward him as well as his wife. She has some certain obligations and responsibilities to fulfill. But if, she, if he dies, if her husband dies, then she can be joined to another man, a second husband, but she still has certain responsibilities and obligations to keep to that second husband in the same way that she had responsibilities and obligation toward her first husband. In fact, she may even produce children to that second, or for that second husband. And so that's the analogy. A, a wife is bound to a husband as long as they live. If the husband dies, she's free to go and marry again with God's blessing. Death nullifies the law, and she's released from it. And she may bear children with her new husband. When death occurs, the law of marriage in this case no longer applies. Well, that's the analogy. Just keep that in mind as we read further. Therefore, my brethren, you also were made to die to the law. And so he's going to talk about the law in this passage. Now, as he goes on to explain, we're not going to take time to talk about this, the law is an instrument that the Satan uses uh, to promote sin. Now, the law itself is good. The law is, is holy. 
But Satan uses the law against us as an instrument to advance his cause and to promote sin. And so if we can be free from the law, well then we won't fall under that particular influence. And so therefore, my brethren, you also were made to die to the law through the body of Christ, so that you may be joined to another, to him who is raised from the dead, in order that we might bear fruit to God. For while we were in the flesh, the sinful passions, which were aroused by the law, were at work in the members of our body to bear fruit for death. But now we've been released from the law, having died to that by which we were bound, so that we serve in the newness of the Spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. And so, we die to the law. Now remember the principle we established earlier, that death nullifies the law. Where death comes in, where death occurs, the law no longer applies. We've died to the law through the death of Jesus. And so now we're free to be joined to another. That is, we're free to be married to Christ. We become the bride of Christ. And as the bride of Christ, we produce fruit for God. You see that again at the end of verse 4. We serve in the newness of the Spirit, not in the oldness of the letter. Well, what does that mean, to serve in the newness of the Spirit? Some people might read that and think, well, you know, you just obey the spirit of the law. Don't worry too much about the letter of the law. It's not exactly what he means. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, he uses similar language where he says of the new covenant that he made us ministers or servants of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. When we serve... We serve not according to the letter that is not according to the Old Testament law of Moses, but we serve according to the New Covenant. And so, a death has taken place. The death of Jesus. We died in the death of Jesus. We died to the law that frees us from the law so that we might be joined to another, married to Christ. And we still have obligations, don't we? As a bride, we have responsibilities to fulfill toward our husband. And we are to produce fruit to God in our lives. And not the fruit of death. What kind of fruit are we producing? Are we producing fruit to God as the bride of Christ? Or are we still producing the fruit of death in our lives? Shall we continue in sin? Remember, that's the original question. Shall we continue in sin? That grace may abound? Absolutely not. We died to the law. A tool of Satan used against us to tempt us to sin. And now we are joined to Christ. And so let's bear fruit for God. Let's serve God. Let's fulfill our responsibilities as a faithful bride. Well, our our time is out. i got a whole other section to go. But we'll stop right there. What, what, what are the, you know, what, what's, the, what's the conclusion to all this? Well, let's go back to the middle of this discussion in Romans chapter 6. And let's see what he says in verse 12. Right, right in the middle of all this discussion. The conclusion is this. Do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lusts. Do not let sin reign in your mortal body. You remember the original question, shall we continue in sin? No. You died to sin. You live to God. You're free from sin, enslaved to God. You died to the law, the instrument of sin, and you're married to Christ. Should we continue in sin? Absolutely not. Do not let sin reign in your mortal body, he says. Do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness. Present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead. And your members, the individual parts of your body, as instruments of righteousness to God. Don't continue in sin. Use your life, use your body, use your mind as a servant of God. As one who lives to God. As someone who is married to God. Okay? Through Christ. It gets specific, and this is just a hint of what I was going to, kind of had planned to say if I had, had time. He, he fills in a lot of the details in chapter 12. 
Now, how should we live? Don't be conformed to the world. Be transformed. Use your abilities, you know, things like that. But maybe that's a, maybe that's a lesson for another occasion. How, how, uh, how are we living? Are we living as people who are dead to sin? Or are we living as people who are, in, who are enslaved to God and or enslaved to sin? Are we living as a faithful bride? How are we living in our lives? We want the blessings of the gospel and the benefits of the gospel. Are we willing to take on the responsibilities of the gospel? Well, only if we are will the result be eternal life. Well, if you're here today, not a Christian, you never obeyed the gospel, we hope that we, we hope that you will. That you'll put your faith in Christ, that you'll repent of your sins, <clears throat> that you'll be baptized, your sins will be washed away, and you can begin serving God faithfully. If you, if you began that kind of life at one point in the past, but you become unfaithful, unfaithful as the bride, someone who's still living in sin, we hope that you'll consider your condition, that you'll make the necessary changes so that you can be right with God and have the prospect of eternal life. If we can help you in some way, we invite you to come as we stand and sing together.